So welcome to part two. Now, what we're going to talk about in this one is going to be something called RFLP. That stands for Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism. Very fun. Okay, let's talk about what these different words mean. Restriction fragments. Okay, remember how we talked about how there's something called a restriction endonuclease, and its job was to cut DNA into fragments. So it's a strict restriction endonuclease, and it's cutting fragments. So restriction fragments are the little pieces that it cuts the DNA into. Length is talking about the fact that, you know, they all can have a different length. Polymorphism is going into that as well. So restriction fragment length polymorphism, polymorphism is basically saying that um, these little pieces of DNA can have different lengths. So what we can do then is we can put them into what's called a gel, and then that gel will allow us to see what sizes all of these fragments were and compare them in something called a DNA fingerprint on a gel. All right, so if we um, go to our PowerPoint, this is where we are now. So let's say that you have um, your crime scene DNA, suspect one, and suspect two, as you see there. And I'll make this bigger so you can actually see what I'm talking about, okay? So um, this gel is going to be this center thing right here. And so that's made of agarose usually, and that's going to have a consistency of like jello. And so it's got these little holes in here at the top that are called wells. So what you'll do is you're going to put the DNA into the separate wells, and you're going to keep track of which well you put the DNA into. And hopefully you remember that DNA has a negative charge. So when you put it into this gel, what's going to happen is you're going to use a buffer. You're going to cover it, which is a liquid. And then if you look, you have a negative charge up at one end of it, and you have a positive charge at the other. Well, from a million years ago, you remember that positive and negative are attracted to one another. So what's going to happen is the negatively charged DNA is going to travel towards that positive charge. Now, as I said, there were little pieces, there were big pieces. Which ones, think about this, which ones do you think would travel the furthest, the fastest, the big pieces or the little pieces? So hopefully you're thinking about the fact that they have to travel through that gel. So they're going to actually have the little pieces that are going to travel the furthest and the bigger pieces are going to stay closer to the well. So what's going to happen at the end of it, if you look down here, is you can actually see a little pattern is going to form based on the pieces that were there. So everybody's pieces are a little bit different in size. And so we're all going to have what's called a different DNA fingerprint. So this pattern of bands that you see here would be that person's DNA fingerprint. So you've got the crime scene, suspect one, and suspect two. And basically all you're looking for is to see if the patterns match. If they match, then that person, that's their DNA that was found at the crime scene or whatever, right? So that's kind of how it works. So you can see there's a lot of ways that you can actually see the results of a gel electrophoresis. This is showing you how you can use fluorescence. And usually on like CSI and all those crazy shows, they usually have like the bright blue lights and everything. It's kind of funny because they have them when they're doing stuff that doesn't even require the blue lights at that time. But it looks cool. So um, that's going to be one way that you can show it. Other way you can do it is you can just dye it, which is what you're going to be doing in lab. And um, a famous gel that I always like to show people, this is actually a gel from the O.J. Simpson trial. Um, and so what happened is um, up here, the Bundy is going to be um, some blood that they found at, or DNA, I'm sorry, that they found at the um, crime scene in front of the house. And then this is DNA that they found in the foyer of the house. Um, and then here's O.J. Simpson's. And so you can kind of see that um, also they have Nicole Brown, um, Goldman, the other people that were there that day. And you can see that theirs don't match any of the crime scene DNA, but you can see OJ's pattern where these um, pink um, arrows are. You can definitely see that he matches all of that. So that was why people kind of freaked out. Like, of course he did it. I mean, it's all right there. But um, the issue, that, there was a lot of issues, but one of them was that the DNA was mistreated. Some people said that they put it into the car and let it sit there while it was warm out. So that could have messed up the DNA and that kind of stuff. So, um, but just interesting how you could see real crime scene and see how that they actually do these gels and see if things match up. Okay. Now back to your notes. That's our gel electrophoresis, which is RFLP. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is cloning. So um, cloning is going to be something that's in the news a lot. 
And plants and animals clone in different ways. Um, plants are going to be able to do what's called topopotency, which you can see right there. And um, that's basically, so we have what are called stem cells, right? And if you take those stem cells, eventually those get differentiated into like you're a muscle cell, you're a nerve cell or whatever. Um, when we talk about cloning plants, you can take a cell from a plant and re-differentiate it. So you can kind of bring it back to stem cell phase and then tell it what kind of cell it's going to be. So that's kind of easier as far as cloning goes. Now for cloning animals, we don't have topopotency. And so what we do is nuclear transplantation. So if we pull this down, you can kind of see um, how this works. So actually, I'll show you a picture. Here we go. Um, so you may have remembered um, Dolly the sheep, which I think is on this next one right here. So Dolly was a clone, um, and um, Dolly has since passed, so RIP Dolly. But anyway, what happens is, um, what they'll do is they will have an unfertilized um, egg cell, and what they will do is they will actually um, take the nucleus out, and then they will actually take the cell from the animal they want to clone and they're going to put that into the egg cell and then it gets implanted into um, another you know organism of the same type and then they give rise to the clone so that's kind of how it works um, it's not foolproof like there's the, all the stuff that they've cloned so far has had like cancer issues or they die really early and so kind of weird stuff has been happening with it um, so the big question is um, you know, how does this actually work? Is this actually moral and that kind of stuff? So you can get into a lot of arguments about that. That being said, another one that we get into arguments about is going to be stem cells. So stem cells are going to be um, cells that are unspecialized. So they're cells that haven't been told what they are going to be yet. And the reason there's so much research going into them is because we can actually, if someone's heart is like dying from heart disease, you can inject stem cells into the heart. And they've done studies where the heart actually regrows the tissue because of those stem cells being there. So um, they are definitely useful. There's just a lot of hype around them because of this next stuff we're going to talk about. So where do we get stem cells? That's the issue. Um, embryos are a very rich form of them. Um, and so where they were getting them is like, let's say people were doing like in vitro or something like that, and they had a bunch of zygotes, but they get pregnant and they, they don't need those other ones. They were getting stem cells from those, and some people had big issue with that. Um, Another place, though, that they've found them is in adults, in um, bone marrow, brain tissue, dental pulp, which is in the middle of your teeth, and the testes. And so um, there are other sources that are a little less controversial, but it's still kind of like this known thing that embryos are the best place to get them. Um, so like I was saying, stem cells can repair damage or diseased tissue. They can repair nerve damage, which is a huge deal because nerve cells don't usually like to regrow, right? So if we could get stem cells, that would help out a lot. Um, and then paralysis, I mean, if we could go any further, you know, there's just so many things we can do with them. Um, so like I was saying, the reason they're controversial is because we are using embryos sometimes. Um, so the last little part here is pretty cool and talking about like, where are we going to use this technology? So yeah, we can use this to figure out if somebody did a crime. We can use this on Mori Povich to figure out who the baby's daddy is and that kind of stuff. But um, what about some real world applications of it? So genetic engineering um, also could include like taking a good gene and replacing a bad gene in someone. Um, so we've done that where we can get those defective genes taken care of. Um, piggyback vaccines is an interesting one. So, um, you know, a vaccine is basically a less harmful form of a virus that you get injected with and then you build up the antibodies and you can't get that virus again. Um, so we do like, you know, we have the flu vaccine, we've got the chickenpox vaccine, you know, all these vaccines. So they tried to come up with one for herpes. Um, the only problem was when they did the trials on it, people actually got herpes, which is not cool. So what they're trying to do with the herpes vaccine is they're trying to piggyback it um, and onto a smallpox virus vaccine and see if that works. Um, I wouldn't recommend signing up for that trial just yet. Just let that one work itself out. Um, but anyway, so those are some medical applications. Then agriculturally, there's some crazy things. Um, we can, you know, genetically engineer plants where they're not as dependent on fertilizer. And you may have heard about GMOs, which are genetically modified organisms. That's the stuff that we're talking about right here, where um, there's been some really crazy things that they've done. Sometimes they do it just to increase nutritional value and make them have less pesticides on them. 
Um, but they're finding like weird side effects now and it hasn't been around long enough to see the long-term effects and that's why you hear about it so much. Um, some really interesting things that they're doing is, um, if you look here, I think I've got some pictures. Yeah, like this stuff is just amazing. Um, I'm just kidding. That is not real, but it's super cute. Um, these are the things that come up when you Google genetic engineering. But um, here is something that's cool. So um, there are spiders that um, when they make their webs, their webs are super, super, super um, strong. And that's actually what they use to make Kevlar. And um, the spiders, they were farming them, but the spiders weren't making a, enough of the silk in order to keep up with the demand for Kevlar. And so what they did is they actually implanted the silk producing gene into goats. And when the goats produced milk, they could actually get the silk in the milk and so they could get a ton more of the silk in a much faster way. So those are what we call farm animals, P-H-A-R-M, so like pharmaceutical almost, um, but kind of interesting. Um, another example that I have in the notes is um, rabbits actually have um, really, really well-developed livers for detoxifying. And so what they're doing with rabbits is they're taking their liver genes, everything to produce their liver and do the detoxification process, and they're actually putting those into poplar trees. Poplar trees are trees that take a little while to mature, so they take a couple of years so they can use them to actually detoxify polluted environments. So they'll take the trees, plant them in there, use them to detoxify because they have the rabbit gene in them and then they kill the tree because um, and the reason they use one that takes a while to flower and seed because they don't want these things spreading and getting into nature right um, so kind of interesting kind of scary if you think about it too so there's a lot of debate about all of this stuff but it is really interesting to at least learn about so that's going to be gene technology i hope you enjoyed it <laughs>